Hello and welcome, it's Francis here. Thank you for coming back to my channel. If this is your first time here, I bid thee welcome. There is a subscribe button and a bell below if you would like to be notified when I upload more content, which I do on a rather ad hoc basis. So as you, as you may have already guessed, I am continuing on with my Sabbath series, in particular looking at the Sabbath seasonal festivals from a Southern Hemisphere perspective. And I will be sharing extracts from my book, Dancing the Sacred Wheel. This is the first edition, and this is the current edition now. Before I go any further, however, I'm just going to remove myself from the screen so that we can acknowledge country. I acknowledge the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which I'm doing this recording. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Just going back to the title page for a moment, as I share the entry to sewing in my book, and it's actually an excerpt from Yvonne Abaro. As the night draws its veil over the land, and autumn draws on her cloak of leaves, the other world draws nearer to our own, and the dead gather in the place of shadows. The dark mother stands revealed in her terrible naked glory. A heart-stopping beauty of autumn is like a spear roaring for blood. So Samhain is a festival that here in the Southern Hemisphere occurs around about the 30th of April. In the Northern Hemisphere, this is um, Beltane for you. And it occurs around the 31st of October in the Northern Hemisphere, which is also your Halloween, another name for which it is known. At this time of the year, the sun is north of the equator. So this is why the Northern Hemisphere, you're beginning to move into summer. While here, south of the equator, we're beginning to feel the onslaught of winter with the sun being less dominant, its energy less strong. And as such, the Celts had a name for this weakening of the sun, anger and more, which actually means the small sun. Samhain comes from the Scots Gaelic, and there's also an Irish Gaelic word as well, both very similar, Samhain and Samhain, both meaning summer's end. So it's the end of summer as we know. And it appears in the Irish myth with the Ulster hero of Cahullan, who goes in search of the divine maiden in the stories. And when Emma tells the Ulster hero Cahullan where he can find the divine maiden, it is mentioned that Samhain is when summer goes to its rest. This is probably a reference relating to the fact that as we're moving into winter, the livestock are gathered in from the summer pastures and are housed over to the winter months. In Australia, of course, this does not occur because our winters aren't usually that intense as they are in Ireland and Scotland. The harvest of the cereal crops have long been completed. Likewise, the other harvests at the autumn equinox, that of the fruit. So Samhain is the third harvest festival. First we had the grain, then we had the fruit. Now this is the festival of blood in that 
any livestock was slaughtered that would feed the tribe or the people for the, through the winter months or any animals that they thought would not last in order to make sure that the feed would last throughout the winter months those animals also were slaughtered and the food preserved so that the tribe could actually have something that, that would give them sustenance throughout the winter months how different our life is today so in the southern skies above us we see Orion way up here in the northern reaches the three stars is making his belt. We've got Canis Major and Canis Minor. Also high up in the sky with Sirius just above Canis Major. Most importantly to us in the Southern Hemisphere is the Southern Cross or Crux, which is here. With the two pointer stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri, pointing the way to the Southern Cross. Another point of reference is Leo the lion is high in the northern sky above us. So Leo looks like a bit of a coat hanger. It's during the winter months that the southern right whales can be seen off the Australian coastline from the head of the bite located in far west South Australia, all the way around to Victoria. These whales journey to these waters to carve and feed. And the head of the bite is also a significant area for the local indigenous peoples, especially in relation to their cultural heritage, because it contains a traditional water hole and meeting place, which is a nice segue into Aboriginal seasons. We're still in Penati for the Ghana people. So Penati actually commences late March, probably around, I don't know, the autumn equinox, and continues through April, May, and almost up to the winter solstice. Penati is usually marked by this unusual star Pana, which appears near the moon and sparkles throughout this time of the year and it is said that modern day astronomers still haven't been able to properly or collectively identify where Pana is. Of course as the land gets colder the mornings are often covered with fog around the waterways, there's dew, and flooding can also restrict movements across the land with the Aboriginals being very, not nomadic, but especially with the Ghana people during the summer months, they would prefer to be along the coast. And when the seasons began to get colder, they moved inland. Up north, around Kakadu, the local people there also had a calendar, but theirs actually had six seasons, which I've talked about before. And we are moving in from April, Brundagaran, through into Yadja, which is beginning to mark probably a cooler time of the year where they're not getting the high humidity. We're in contemporary witchcraft. The goddess now becomes the crone of winter. And in some traditions, she's seen stalking the land with her scythe, ready to cut down any remaining uh, stalks of corn or any vegetables that have not been harvested yet. This is usually her gifts. You leave these or these fruits and vegetables are left for her. They're not to be taken for ourselves. In Scotland, she is often described as the Kalik, the crone of winter. But also in Poland, there is the Marana, who is the goddess of death. I don't know who did this beautiful picture of her, but she's got multiple hands. She's almost very sort of Hecate light. 
of all her symbolisms, but in particular there is this scythe that is cutting away the dross, the things that are no longer wanted, preparing us as we go inward into our underworld, into our time of sleep and rest before we become reborn again. The goddess is definitely the dark mother who devours the god so that she may give birth to him again. Her womb is also the tomb in the underworld where the horned god will reside during the winter months as the dreaded lord of shadows until his rebirth at the winter solstice. And as we can see here, here's a beautiful depiction of the horned god from the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic that can be found at Boz Castle in Cornwall, southern England. And now that the airways are opening up, especially for us in Australia, this is definitely one place I can't wait to get back to. The crone also lights the Sawain fire and prepares her own descent into the underworld. This fire lights her sacred cauldron, which contains the mysteries of all life, and into which she prepares a sacred brew. Are we brave enough to taste what she offers? With her magic, she parts the veil between the worlds, descending into the underworld, where she joins with her beloved, the Hornet God. And from probably late autumn all the way through to midwinter, especially across the northern countries of Scandinavia into Germany, even found within uh, England traditions, we have the God stalking the lands as the veils between the land of the living and the land of the dead begin to thin and this is known as the wild hunt where the lord of the underworld whether it's odin or woden rides out capturing or collecting the souls of the dead the lost to take back to his underworld and even in so Welsh law, this Gwyneth Nath as well, rides out from the tour doing a similar job. Again, within my tradition of witchcraft, Salwain is the time when we remember those who've gone before, time of our ancestors. And in particular, due to the seasonal differences, the passing of Alexanders, who co-founder of the Alexandrian tradition of contemporary witchcraft, he died on the 30th of April, which is Salwain here in the Southern Hemisphere, Beltane in the Northern Hemisphere. So it's rather appropriate timing for us. This therefore makes Salway one of our most somber festivals. And the veil was thin. And we spend time to acknowledge those who have passed, lighting a candle for each so that they may join us. And I'd just like to share this poem that I don't know who is the author, but it talks to this observance and remembering of our ancestors. Your tombstone stands amongst the rest, neglected and alone. The name and date are chiseled out on polished marble stone. It reaches out to all who care. It is too late to mourn. You did not know that I exist and you died. And I was born. Yet each, each of us are cells of you in flesh and bone and blood and bone. Our blood contracts and beats a pulse entirely not our own. Dear ancestor, 
a place you filled 100 years ago spreads out amongst the loved ones you left who would have loved you so. I wondered if you lived and loved. I wonder who, if you knew, that one day I would find this spot and come to visit you.